Ready? All righty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Marshall W. Allworth Planetarium. My name is Braden. I'm a student worker here at UMD. Out in the hall, you guys also met Clayton, who is another student worker here at UMD. And in the back, we have Jessica, the director of the planetarium here. She's the one that makes all of this happen. So can we give her a round of applause, please, everybody? Thank you. You're too nice to me. All righty, and welcome to our Wonderstruck Wednesdays. These are our free shows. And the show that we have for you guys today is going to be Exploring the July Sky. With that, we go show you guys a bunch of constellations and other, other things that can be seen within July's sky. Uh, other than that, I uh, have a couple of safety announcements to say before we get started. Uh, it does tend to get a little bit dark in here, so if you ever have to leave at any point during the show, we have glow-in-the-dark tape around the planetarium. That tape will lead you to the entrance that you always came in. You can use that as your exit. If you ever have to use the bathroom, bathrooms are going to be located right in the front atrium in front of that big telescope that you guys walked past. Um, one more thing, if you guys have any questions at all during the show, please feel free to uh, raise your hand. I will call on you guys, or if you have questions uh, back at the, at the stream, feel free to just stay that in the stream. I will also be watching that as well, because this is also streamed live from our Facebook page as well. But other than that, that's really all I have to say, so I say let's get started. <laughs> All right. I'm um, going to get our lights turned down here. Uh, we are currently looking up at our beautiful sky. Um, it is actually nice and pretty and clear out today. It's a beautiful day today. Um, so because we are still, you know, in summer, sun is staying up for later. Right now the sun is still up over in the west. But that's not a problem because here we can use some planetary magic and fast forward time and let the sun set. And we're going to do a little bit more magic here and I'm going to just get rid of these pesky clouds. I know I wish I had that power in real life. It would be amazing. <laughs> So um, over in the west, we are seeing Venus still shining brightly in the west right at sunset. So that first point of light you see in the west, that's going to be the planet Venus. And that's why it's often called the evening star or the morning star. When it's the one up in the morning, it's the last thing you see uh, before the sun gets all nice and bright. Um, Mars is also hanging out nearby, but it's still a little bit too bright to see Mars too well. So what we're going to do is fast forward time a little bit more. Um, before I do that, you can also see little Mercury just peeking out. It's kind of just at the horizon for us, so we're not quite ready to see Mercury yet. But let's fast forward to even later. And of course, at the front you can see the date and time of which the sky is. Um, so we have fast forwarded until the sun got a little bit further, the skies get a little bit darker. So we're looking at about 1036, I believe is what it says. Venus has set, but we are seeing Mars over in the west. And we'll see a few more planets later in the night as well. But for now, we had just have Venus and Mars hanging out in the west after sunset. Now, at this point in the night, we are starting to see some of the brighter stars. We can pick out maybe a few bright constellations, um, but we still have some residual sunlight that's making the sky a little bit brighter. We're still not in true darkness. So we'll fast forward until we get to true darkness, which happens pretty late this time of year. We're looking at about 11.50 before you get to true darkness, once the sun is set far enough below the horizon that we're not seeing any more light from it. So this is the view that you would get outside of the city where we wouldn't have any light pollution. 
Um, and we have lots of stars and constellations and other fun things to see up in the sky. And we're going to get started here in the north. And the first thing that I want to point out, the one that most people can recognize, over in the northwest, we have the seven stars that make up the Big Dipper. Now, the Big Dipper is technically not a constellation. It's an asterism. So it's a smaller grouping of stars within a larger constellation. In this case, the Big Dipper is the seven brightest stars in the Greek constellation of Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. So to see the bear, we have to add in some other stars. The handle of the dipper is the tail of the bear. And then we have back over to the head, and then front legs, belly, and back legs. And I'll make that a little bit easier by putting some nice art up so you can see it. There's our bear. Now, since we have um, a Big Dipper and a Big Bear, what else do you think we would have? Yeah, we have a big one, we gotta have a little one. So to find the Little Dipper, because it can be tricky, because the stars aren't as bright, we're gonna use the Big Dipper to help us. We're gonna take the front two stars in the cup of the Dipper. Those are known as our pointer stars. And if we follow those, they will point us over to this bright star. This star is named Polaris, but you might know it as the North Star. Now, you'll notice Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky. A lot of people have that misconception because they know that Polaris is important. Um, so they assume it must be the brightest star. What actually makes Polaris important, if I fast forward time a little bit more, we can watch as the Earth rotates, all of the stars in the sky rotate around, except for Polaris. It's the only one that stands still because Earth's North Pole is pointed right at Polaris. So it stands still while everything else moves around. And that's what makes it important. It's always in the same place, it's always in the north, so it was really useful for navigation. All right, I'm just going to reset us back to the time we were at before I fast forward it again. All right, Polaris here is the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. And there we have our Little Dipper. It also has seven stars, just like the Big Dipper. Um, if you have trouble when you're out stargazing seeing more than three stars in the Little Dipper, that's perfectly normal. The other four are incredibly dim and hard to see. You have to have super dark skies and really well dark adapted eyes in order to see all seven. In fact, I've only seen all seven once in my life. And that was when I was up the Gunflint Trail right next to the Boundary Waters which happened to be Minnesota's darkest skies mm -hmm. and some of the darkest skies in the country. So little little tidbit, get up there if you can. I'll come with us on the Dark Sky Caravan. I was going to say, also, we, do, <laughs> we are having a, a second week of, of August. Uh, the planetarium here does a, little, does a little thing we call the Dark Skies Caravan, which is a week where we just celebrate some of Minnesota's natural dark skies. So if you guys are in Duluth during that time, feel free to stop by any of the locations we go to. All of that you can find on our Facebook page. Mm, or you can just right now. website currently. Yeah. Uh, or you could just, you know, ask one of us at the end of the show. We'll yep. give you as much information as we have currently. Or follow our Facebook and I'll be getting that schedule posted later this week. Yes. All right. Um, so our little dipper here is also our little bear. We don't have to add in any extra stars. The handle is the tail, and then the dipper is the little bear body. Um, yeah, it looks weird, I know. <laughs> Both of our bears have these unusually long tails, which, you know, I've never seen a bear like that. In fact, I always say the little bear looks a lot more like a little squirrel, in my opinion. 
But there is a story to explain these unusually long tales. Uh, since both of these constellations are Greek, this story also comes to us from the ancient, ancient Greeks. And it starts with Zeus. Uh, Zeus is the king of the Greek gods. He lives up on Mount Olympus with his wife Hera and all of the other gods and goddesses. But Zeus likes to come down to Earth. Um, one day he's done that. He's at a party. He ends up meeting a woman named Callisto. They become real good friends, but Hera gets jealous of Callisto and decides to turn her into a bear. And off she runs into the woods. Um, now, what they didn't know at the time was uh, Callisto had a son named Arcus. And after not seeing his mom for a while, he got worried and went to go look for her in the woods. And that's when he came across this big bear. He didn't know that was his mom. So once that bear started walking towards him, he pulled out his bow and arrow to defend himself. Nothing bad happened. Zeus came back down just in time to catch Arcus before anything happened and explained to him that this was his mom. And um, Zeus, feeling a little bit guilty and unable to turn Callisto back to human, he did the next best thing. He turned Arcus into a bear. And to keep the two bears safe and together forever, he decided to put them up into the night sky. But to get them there, he had to pick them up by their fuzzy little bear tails, spin them around, and fling them into the night sky. And it's that process of being spun and flung by their tails that stretched them out. And that's why they have such long tails. Makes sense, right? Definitely didn't just invent a story to explain why their bears had long tails, but you know, that's part of the fun of the night sky, I think. I agree. <laughs> All right, um, before we move on from here, there are a couple of things around our bears that are really cool to look at, especially if you have a telescope. So first, if we look over at the kind of crook of the handle of the Big Dipper or the crook of the tail of the Big Bear, this is a star named Miser. But if you're able to look very carefully, you may notice that there is a second star right next to it. And that second star is named Altor. Now, if you have really good vision, you can see the two of them. And for a lot of early cultures, this double star of a Miser and Altor were actually used as an eye test to see if you had good vision or not. Because if you did have good vision, you could see the two stars. If you're like me and your vision is terrible, not a problem. Point a pair of binoculars or a small telescope at that star, and you will be able to see that it is, in fact, two little stars there of Miser and Alcor. Um, and these are a double star. So the two stars don't actually orbit around each other like a binary. They just happen to be close to each other from our perspective here. Um, and then the other thing I want to point out is also right next to the bear's tail is something called Messier 51, or the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now, we can't see much of anything here right now um, with just your naked eye, but if you're able to point a pair of binoculars or a small telescope that way, you will see a beautiful spiral galaxy. Um, you'll also see that it has a nice little companion next to it uh, that it is currently eating. Um, yes, galaxies eat each other. It is an actual term that we call galactic cannibalism. I know. I'm telling you, astronomers, they either have the coolest name for things or the most mundane, boring name for things. <laughs> like we have galactic cannibalism, and then we have the very large telescope. I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah. All right. A couple of last things here in the north. Uh, if we take those pointer stars once again to Polaris, 
and then keep going and go back down a little bit, you'll reach this W in the sky. That W is the Queen Cassiopeia. Now, yes, this is a really good point to mention that sometimes constellations require a good bit of imagination. Um, you will see a lot of different interpretations of how you turn a W into a woman. This is one way. Um, but that is our Queen Cassiopeia. Um, and she's a really good one to find. Those stars are very bright. and You'll be able to see them even with some light polluted skies. All right, last up, if we look in between our two bears, you will see um, a few stars in between. Well, those stars start the tail of Draco the dragon. And his body winds around the little bear and back up where we have his head and he is breathing fire all over someone who we'll meet in a little bit. <laughs> that is Draco the dragon. All right. Well, at this point, I am going to turn us over to the west. Um, now, this is the same as if you were to just stand up and turn around, but you don't have to do that in here. I can turn the sky for us. And over here in the west, we are still seeing the last few of our spring constellations. Um, so first up, we're going to go back to our Big Dipper. We're going to go to the handle of the Big Dipper. You'll notice it's curved or arced. And what we're going to do is follow the arc of the handle until we reach this bright star named Arcturus. So the saying is, from the Big Dipper, you follow the handle and you arc to Arcturus. Now, Arcturus is part of the constellation Bootes. Now, most people say that it looks like a kite, which I think fits pretty well. Um, you'll also often hear an ice cream cone, which is my personal favorite. That's what I think it looks like. Uh, but he is supposed to be a man named Boates. He is the bear herder. He's herding our two bears across the sky. And if you thought turning a W into a queen was hard, I still haven't quite figured out an ice cream cone into a man. I see it. I mean, it does help having the art in front of you to try and visualize it. I still say he's got very Kingpin-esque physique. I, <laughs> I, 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 I just say he's, uh, uh, his other arm is just behind his body. Uh, so that, yeah. that is our pal, Bo Taste, who is helping to kind of keep the bears in place and herding our two bears across the night sky. Um, I'm gonna turn us just a little bit more, we're a little bit more towards the southwest. Now, right next to Boates, you may see that there is a U shape right next to him. This is Corona Borealis, or the Northern Crown constellation that I think looks pretty close to what it should be. Now, I definitely picture it more as a tiara than how this art is, but still, pretty good. Um, and from here, I'm going to turn the crown's art off for a second. Um, from here, we are now going to find Hercules. Now, most people will tell you, if you want to find Hercules, you need to look for the keystone. And I'm going to be perfectly honest, for most of my life, when people told me that, I didn't know what to look for. I didn't know what a keystone was. So I'm going to teach you the trick that I was taught later on that I've always been able to use to find Hercules. And in order to do this, 
we want to turn our crown into a spoon, which is why I like to think of bow taste as an ice cream cone, because then it makes a little bit of sense why you need a spoon in the sky. So in order to do that, you are going to connect these two stars next to our crown to become the handle of our spoon. And by connecting those, you have found the belt of Hercules. So that is his belt right here. So we have his body, arms, and legs. And I'll turn on that art. Um, he is upside down, looking like he's doing an awesome ninja roll. Um, that is because he is currently fighting Draco the dragon. That's who Draco is breathing fire at. So you may know the story of Hercules. Um, he is the son of Zeus. Being half god, he has some powers. Um, in the case of Hercules, those powers are super strength. And that super strength ended up making a lot of people scared of him. And he didn't like that. So he was told if he completed these 12 tasks, we now know them as the 12 labors of Hercules, um, but if he completed these 12 tasks, he would prove that he was a good person. And what we're seeing here in the sky play out is one of those tasks. He had to fetch the golden apples from a special tree, and that tree was guarded by Draco the dragon. So we're seeing him battle Draco so that he can get to that tree and get those golden apples. All right. Turn us a little bit more to the south. Over in the south here, we can see this fuzzy band really arching high above the sky. That is our Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy we live in. And summer is the best time to try and see it because we happen to be looking towards the center of our galaxy during the summer. And of course, the center is where most of the stars and other stuff is, so you get a much better view of the Milky Way. It's much bigger and brighter. Um, so if you are able at all, anytime this summer, to get out from the city lights one night, I highly encourage it so that you can see the summer Milky Way. While you're looking at the summer Milky Way, you can also search for two constellations that lie on either side of it here in the south. Now first to the right of the Milky Way, I guess westward, um, it's currently situated right above where the time is. You will see what looks like a kind of T on its side. There it comes. Um, and this is Scorpius. And so we have um, that top part is kind of his head and his pincers, and then his tail uh, hooks down and partly goes below our horizon. We don't see the full tail from here. So that is Scorpius. Uh, and then on the other side of the Milky Way, just above where we currently have the date, you will see what most people refer to as the asterism of the teapot. And I think it looks really much like a teapot, right? You have the kettle, the little handle, the top, the spout, the Milky Way is the steam coming out of the teapot. Um, believe it or not, that teapot is actually part of the constellation of Sagittarius, um, which is a centaur. Um, so you get a centaur from a teapot. Still figuring that one out. I see it. You always see more than I do. Uh, you just have to use your imagination. Is it just my science brain? I, I, I think I think it's I, I think I just have a more active imagination, to be honest. Oh, that can, hurt a little bit. I, oh I didn't hurt. mean that as like a diss. Oh I'm sorry. Uh I I I, I it's yeah, okay, your job I, is safe, don't worry. I can't come back from that, I can't come back from that. I'm sorry. All right, well, uh, we have one last 
set of constellations I want to show you. Um, they are over in the east, so I'm going to turn the sky once more to look over to the east. And high up in the sky in the east, you will find three bright stars which make up our summer triangle. We have Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And that is our summer triangle because it's a triangle that's visible in the summer. I told you, either really cool or really boring name. Yeah. <laughs> now, each of these stars is associated with their own constellation. Uh, Vega is part of the constellation of Lyra the Lyre or Lyra the Harp. Uh, the Lyre is... Brayden, you tell an early uh, version of the harp. It's a, it's a, it's an ancient uh, stringed instrument. So think of essentially just a, just a very like a small version of a, of a harp. Or if you've ever seen any art of like uh, the god Apollo or art of the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, that's typically the instrument associated with them. And in fact, the the um, instrument that we're seeing in the sky there is actually the instrument that did a belong to. Orpheus and Apollo. Yeah. So that's a long story. <laughs> All right. Um, the star Deneb is the tail feathers of Cygnus the Swan. You can see his long wings stretching out and then the long beak stretching towards the south. This is one that definitely, I think, looks like it's supposed to. You can really see a swan there flying in the sky. Uh, and then lastly, Altair is a part of another bird. Um, it's part of Attila the eagle. Um, with the sticks, it definitely looks more like a stingray. Uh, but with the art, it might look a little bit more like an eagle. Um, and in this case, Attila was um, why am I blanking on the word? He worshipped for Zeus. Mm -hmm. um, he did a lot of different tasks for Zeus. So Zeus ended up putting him in the sky as kind of a thank you after he passed um, in honor of everything he did for him. Um, now, uh, a couple of things that you can see here if you do have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Um, next to our lyre, for our harp, right in there, right in between those two stars there, sits the ringed nebula. And it looks like this. Um, this is what we call a planetary nebula. So this is what happens when a small star dies. Um, so this is what's going to happen to our sun in about 5 billion years. Uh, and then over about halfway between, or about a third of the way from Attila to Cygnus the Swan, we have another planetary nebula. This one is the Dumbbell Nebula. And if we take a look at it, 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 it kind of looks like a dumbbell. The other one looks like a ring. Again, either really clever or really boring. But I can't call these boring. They're so cool looking. They're really beautiful. Um, and I will end us off here with one last story um, that I don't think I've said this year yet. It's one of my favorites, though. And it's actually about the two stars, Vega and Altair. Um, in Chinese culture, these two stars are known as uh, the cow herder and the weaver girl. Um, now, the cow herder was exactly that. This is um, a boy who was born into a family of cow herders. Um, so he's typically, you know, lower class. Um, whereas the weaver girl either is from a very wealthy family or her parents are gods. It kind of depends on the version you're reading. Either way, though, these two kids fell in love. And the weaver girl's parents were not happy with this match. So they decided to separate them. And they did so by placing 
the two of them across a giant river, which is represented by our Milky Way. Um, and so they are on opposite sides of this raging river that they're unable to cross, so they're not, not able to get to each other. Except on the seventh month, or on the seventh day of the seventh month, um, all of the birds get together and they create a bridge across the river so that the cow herder and the weaver girl can spend one day together. Um, and in Chinese culture, they still celebrate that day as kind of their version of a Valentine's Day. Um, and I like it. It's one of those stories, few stories, constellation stories or star stories that, you know, actually has kind of a sweet, happy <laughs> ending. It's not too happy. They only get to see each other once a year, I know. But it's least, still really sweet. At least they get to see each other, especially with the the other story associated <laughs> with Vega. Yeah. Uh, which is really sad and depressing. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, that has been our July sky. With that, I am going to fast forward time again through the night. Um, just before the sun comes up, we've got several other planets visible. Saturn and Jupiter are up really early in the morning. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are there as well, but you have to have a telescope to see those. You can't see those with just your naked eye. And for tonight, the moon is also hanging out, but the moon moves pretty quickly across the sky, so it's going to be at different places every every night, every day every night. Um, so we will whoops, hit the wrong button. We fast forwarded very quickly to sunrise. Um, and we'll just let <laughs> the sun come up on our next day. I hope no one had plans for this evening because we just fast forwarded through all of it. <laughs> um, but as the sun is rising up, I will turn our lights up. Uh, that brings us to the end of our show. Thank you everyone so much for coming out to see us. If you have any questions, let us know. There are also some star charts um, over on the table in front of the TV. Please grab one to take with you. Um, it will help you find all of the stars and constellations and some other ones as well that we didn't talk about tonight. Uh, but again, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again next time.